Hi, my name is Magnus. Uh, this is a recording of a talk I did for Serex FF back in December. It's about browser safety and how you can browse the web more securely. In this talk, I will show you why this affects you. I will show some examples of how you can be compromised from the web. And uh, finally, I will give you some ideas on what you can do about it. Okay, so what's the big deal here? I mean, everyone is using the web all the time. I would argue that the web browser is the number one exposed application on your machine. Uh, no other application receives that amount of untrusted, potentially harmful information from different servers all over the world daily. On top of that, the browser is a very complex application having millions of lines of code, uh, being developed by hundreds or even thousands of developers. And with the increased complexity of the application, uh, you will get more bugs, bugs that can be exploited in a way to compromise you as the user. Perhaps even more scary are the add-ons. Uh, an add-on can see whatever you see on the web. It can do whatever it wants with this information. It can modify the web pages so you see something completely different, or it can take data from the uh, web page and, and send it somewhere else. So you actually put a lot of faith into uh, this random developer that developed this add-on. Aside from exploiting the implementation of the browser or the add-ons, you can also exploit the web logic. And uh, with web logic, I mean HTTP, HTML, and JavaScript. And you can actually do a lot of harm while staying within the confines of those standards. Okay, now I'm going to demo an example of how to exploit the web logic uh, through cross-site scripting or XSS. Here I have a little demo of a cross-site scripting uh, exploit. So uh, in this demo, we have an online bank uh, called stupidbank.com. So we open up to stupidbank.com. Uh, you can log in. Um, you have a balance and you can donate money to charity. Uh, so um, yeah, let's donate 100 crowns. Uh, we can go back and check our balance, which changed to 900. Uh, this is the back end, back end of the bank. Uh, you can see that we logged in, we got the session cookie, and when we donated money, our balance changed. We can try this again. So we're back at 800 crowns. Um, that's all good. Um, I will log out, close the browser, and um, here we have another server called the evil server and um, someone with the evil server sends a, a phishing email to people that they believe are customers of the stupid bank and uh, the email looks really nice uh, it says like uh, log into the bank to get your uh, additional credit or whatever and and they provide you with a bitly link uh, so we, uh, you click the link, uh, you get to stupidbank.com, um, you log in again, or wait, so this is the backend of the evil server here. So as you can see, when I type the password here, it actually passes that, my username and password to that evil server. How can this happen? I mean, we're still at the stupidbank.com. The thing that this uh, cross-site scripting exploit is the fact that if you log in with an incorrect password, it outputs an error message to the user and it's not uh, sanitized for scripts, etc. So when I open this bit.ly link, it actually contains a crafted uh, JavaScript that gets injected to the page and uh, makes it possible to alter the behavior of the site. Of course, it's not really common that you use like username and password to your bank, perhaps, but we can actually try something, try another cross-site scripting exploit. This one is a bit more realistic. Here I, um, I just log in again, and this time my session cookie value gets passed to the evil site. And if you have the cookie, you can do a lot of bad things. Uh, I jump on the session 
and start doing uh, stuff as a logged in user. Okay, so that was cross-site scripting. Now I will do a demo of cross-site request forgery, which is another web exploitation technique. We are using the same online bank as before. Uh, we also have the evil server. So let's start with uh, logging into the bank. So um, you can see from the bank backend that I logged in, uh, I can donate 100 crowns. My new balance is 900. And then someone sends me a link, like check out th this link. I open the link. And as you can see in the back bank backend here, it starts to empty my account. And also if I if I reload this page, it will show that my, my balance is now zero. So what, what's going on here? Let's look at the requests. So what you can see here is that this site is issuing requests to the stupid bank. And it can do this since I'm already logged in here and this browser has already established an authenticated session towards the stupidbank.com. So any request that I do from this site to the stupid bank will behave as coming from the same authenticated session as this tab. And yeah, that's cross-site request forgery for you. Trusting third-party scripts. It's not really an exploit per se, but it's um, it's like a stupid design decision by web developers that will jeopardize the security of the end user. And um, I will show you this in a demo. Okay, so we're back at the uh, the same online bank. I, uh, I log into the bank. My balance is thousand crowns, but as you can see here in the bank backend, something is going on. I just logged into the bank as normal. My balance is a thousand crowns. Okay, so four. Wait. Okay, so it's, this is strange. Okay, so, well, this is actually a third party script doing evil. If we look at, this is an extension that lists kind of all of the requests from this site. What we can see here is that the stupid bank includes a script from googletagservices.com. And basically what you do when you include third party scripts is that you're giving this server full access to what's going on on your site and someone has modified this script so that it do two things here first it empties my account by issuing uh, donations and also it masks this by changing the content of this page so that to the end user it still looks that looks like we have our balance, yet the account is empty. So I I added a delay here uh, with the update, but I, that was just for show. So typically you don't need a delay. So um, yeah, the end user won't notice anything until they try to donate and notice that, wait, I don't have the balance. That's the, um, it's kind of scary. So if you go to more or less any web page. So if I go to say Nordea, which is like the, the uh, biggest bank in, in Sweden, you can see here, it tries to load scripts from cookiereports.com and tiqcdn.com. So basically what it does is that it trusts all of these servers. So if you somehow get malicious code into these servers, so they can change the login forms or, or whatever they want. It's really bad idea to include third party scripts on your page, but still, as you see, almost everyone does it. So an interesting thing with these examples was that they didn't exploit a vulnerability in the browser, nor did they go outside the scope of HTTP, HTML or, or JavaScript. Instead, they exploited the mistakes and poor design decisions of the web developer. And you see this all the time, developers making mistakes, taking shortcuts, 
and it's very hard for the browser to be able to detect these kinds of attacks because they don't break any contracts. Instead, what you have to do as an end user is to be aware and try and spot these yourself and take countermeasures. And in the following slides, I will show you how you can do that. Okay, so if, you, if you're a web developer, perhaps you got a bit offended by, by my previous statement there, but um, it, I, I can't stress it enough. Uh, I see this all the time. So here are some resources that you can go to if you if you want to read up on web security. OWASP is a great start. And once you have something, uh, you can you can use the Swedish uh, service called WebCall, which kind of tests your site for things like third-party script and uh, cross-site scripting headers, etc. So it's it's actually pretty nice. Okay, so what all this boils down to uh, as an end user is to limit your exposure. And you can do this in a number of ways. Perhaps the most obvious one is to carefully choose your browser. There are a bunch of different browsers out there and they're good at different things. Say that I want to do something really private. I might want to opt for the Tor browser or if I want to do something secure, I will go for the Chrome browser. Even though the Chrome browser is kind of bad at privacy, it all depends on what you're doing. So my recommendation here is that don't just use one browser, use different ones for different things. Personally, I use a combination of, of the Tor browser and Firefox and Chromium. This graph is, is not really accurate in any way. It's just, I, I took some browsers and, and threw them out there. When I did this talk in, in December, I got a comment about uh, Edge and uh, apparently Edge uh, today is, is very secure and they have like isolation uh, between tabs, etc. So probably not very fair to put it uh, in the less secure quadrant here. But anyway, the, the takeaway from this slide is that not all browsers are equal and they're good at different things. So pick your browser for whatever thing that you're going to do. Okay, so another tip here is to become a minimalist. And even though I, I kind of like this approach for my life in general, I'm talking about the web browser. And what you can do is you can disable features. Again, the web browsers today, they are really complex. They have a lot of functionality, most of which you probably don't need, like WebRTC, the HTML5 canvas, third-party cookies. There's a bunch of different functionalities that disable and, and everything will work as usual. Okay, so if you're using Firefox, I can recommend this script. It's a um, very extensive setting scripts for Firefox that disables all of the features that you typically don't need. And um, even though it's, it's kind of targeted towards increased privacy, it kind of holds for, for security a lot as well. So go check this out, download it, and apply it to your Firefox browser. So disabling JavaScript is probably the number one thing that you can do to protect yourself on the web. Of course, it will break a lot of sites, but there is a trick that you can do with the help of an add-on to find a good middle ground between site working and still protecting you against evil. So the trick is just allowing scripts on the first level domain. Using an add-on such as uh, Umatrix, you can default to only load uh, JavaScript from the main page. Here, for instance, my online bank I allow scripts from the bank, but I deny the scripts from the third-party included scripts. This vastly improves the security of this site, while mostly it will work anyway. And if it doesn't, and you really need that information, I mean, you can just click and enable that third-party script if you want. Okay, next we have the HTTPS and CAs. Um, so whenever you go to a site over SSL, you might feel more secure because the communication is encrypted and the authenticity of the site is kind of verified. However, the certificate of that site can be issued from any of the around like 140 different CAs installed in your browser. Say that you go to the, your Swedish bank again, and for some reason, the certificate might be issued by a CA in China. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So, so what you can do is you, you can go into the settings and, and remove the CAs that you don't really trust. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation how an add-on could increase your exposure, but at the same time, a good add-on can limit your exposure. So 
it all depends on the add-on. And I actually use a couple of, of add-ons myself. No script, which is good to limit some types of tags on web pages. For instance, I don't want to use the canvas or the embed tag in HTML. I can just limit that. HTTPS everywhere, which kind of force traffic to go over HTTPS if there is an HTTPS version of that site. Umatrix, which I showed in an earlier demo, which kind of give you a good control of third-party requests and different types of requests in a site. uBlock Origin removes ads and they also increase your exposures. There have been scenarios where you make very targeted ads and the ad exploits your browser. You can target the, uh, the exploit to certain individuals by targeting the ad. Most modern browsers today, they have some form of isolation. It might be tab isolation where the different tabs run in separate processes and don't share that much information between each other. It might be site isolation where, for instance, third-party cookies aren't shared between sites. So if two sites use the same third-party resource, they still have their own unique third-party cookie value, which makes it impossible to track between sites. If you want to take it a step further, I would recommend isolating complete instances of the browser using any form of virtualization technique such as VMware or, or VirtualBox. You can create a base template with your known good state of the browser, and then you can just restart and spawn that instance when you need to do your browsing. Depending on your virtualization platform, it might even be possible to spawn multiple instances of that same template. I'm a big fan of isolation and compartmentalization, and I use Cubes OS, which is an OS built for this purpose. Let me show you this in a demo. Okay, so here I have two browsers running. They are running in separate VMs based on my base browser template VM. I can easily spawn a new instance of this VM. And what is really nice with Cubes is that it simplifies creating and destroying VMs. I just need to close my browser window here and that VM will be destroyed and all traces removed from it. Okay, my, my last tip for today is to go stateless. And uh, what I mean with that is that you, you can configure your browser to always start in like incognito mode. Um, that means that you don't store any cookies, you don't store any passwords and, and stuff like that. You always start fresh from a known good state and it, it might sound cumbersome, but I mean, once you get used to it, I, I, I don't have a problem with it at all. As for smartphone browsers, my recommendation is actually to try and stay away from the smartphone when you do web browsing. Instead, as far as possible, use your laptop. The browser of the laptop is way more flexible and secure than the one on the smartphone. If you really do need to use the web on your phone, I would suggest the big ones like Safari on iPhone or Chrome on, on Android. Uh, myself, I use uh, Graphene OS on my phone and, and it has a security hardened browser called Vanadium. I also use uh, Bromite, which is like a, a more privacy focused version of a browser. To summarize, um, different browsers are good at different things. Don't use one for everything. Instead, Pick one that is good for that particular purpose that you're doing. Disable browser features that you don't need, such as uh, WebRTC, third-party cookies, and uh, HTML5 canvas. Remember that most add-ons see whatever you see on the screen, and you put a lot of faith into the add-on and the developer behind it. Disable JavaScript except for the first level domain. And finally, use multiple isolated browser instances. And that was it. Thank you for watching. If you're curious of who I am and what I do, I consider myself a security aware software engineer. I uh, love hacking hardware and software. And um, yeah, I have my own company. So feel free to reach out to me, send me an email or add me on LinkedIn or whatever. Thank you for watching.